students. If you're, if you're thinking about doing uh, uh, aid work, if you're thinking about uh, technical social assistance, if you're thinking about global problems, this is an individual uh, who you can model yourselves after. And that's why I'm really thrilled to introduce to you the aid administrator, Rajiv Shah. I'm uh, so honored to be with you and excited to learn from you as we'll have a chance to have a discussion where we'll hear your ideas because ultimately this is an institution that has ideas, has capabilities, has experience, has uh, connectivity. It's wonderful to have so many representatives from uh, our partner countries here as well. And we are proud to be associated with Florida International University. I'm, uh, I'm particularly excited because the spirit that has transformed uh, what I think of as the transformation that's taking place in our country uh, on development is proudly on display at this institution. I love your, your tagline there uh, because being worlds ahead in the future requires engaging in a deeper and more fundamental way in a world that is coming together quickly. Folks in this institution and in this city understand that, of course, because you're at the forefront of a globally inter integrated economy. But I'd like to make the case to you today that, that we all have in our capacity the ability to shape the kind of interconnected world we live in. We don't have a choice. It is going to be more interconnected. But we have an opportunity to make sure that those connections result in more human welfare, more equity, more economic opportunity and more safety and security. But it's a choice we're going to have to make, and it's a choice we're going to have to make together. Now, students here at FIU are already making that choice. You've been engaged directly in efforts to minimize the risk of disasters in El Salvador to ensure the sustainability of some of our most precious resources, like the Mara River in Tanzania. It's a partnership we have together that has not only grown over time, but has delivered some extraordinary and very real results. In the late 1980s, FIU and USAID partnered on the agency's first major media initiative, which focused on training journalists across Latin America in investigative journalism and election coverage. We all know that within a few years, uh, you were able to bring media owners and journalists together to produce the first journalist ethics code for Central America. This effort built on a long-standing partnership going all the way back to 1984 to strengthen the capacity of justice systems in Latin American countries. Over 27 years, together, we've helped build rural justice houses in Colombia, established an association of law school deans in Nicaragua and elsewhere, and formed strong relationships that continue to bring law students here every year to your College of Law. In fact, I understand that currently there are about 30 Colombian law school students here tonight. Are, are there any here with us now? Put your hand up. Oh, good. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, but that's exactly what this institution has done and is capable of doing. Now, in addition to that, you've rallied at times that are critical moments when our country comes together to express what our values mean when we put them in action. This, of course, most recently occurred around the tragic earthquake in January of 2010 in Haiti. I had the chance, it was my first international trip in this role. I had been in the job about a week, and I had a chance to visit Port-au-Prince about 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours after the after the devastating earthquake. And the images that you see there uh, stick with you for forever, I presume. But during that period when uh, US, the US government, US aid, was called on to mount the largest humanitarian relief operation in our history, which we did, and with partnership with our military colleagues and so many others from around the world, successfully saved tens of thousands of lives and got food to three million people and helped to pursue an immediate response that brought all of the resources of our government together. But in addition to that, and just as important, was what you did as students and communities around this country did 
in that moment of awareness and commitment. In that moment, more than half of all American families, more than half, gave directly to relief and response efforts in Haiti. That's more people that, uh, than gather to watch the Super Bowl every year, which otherwise is probably the, the moment that brings us together as a country more effectively than perhaps any other. And it is telling, because the message there is that deep down inside, Americans care. They care about this work. They care about our values and how they're expressed. And they're committed, even if it's out of their own resources. And that's why it's critical that we explain to the American public and others that these efforts, when we do them together and well, generate real results, that today we've seen a more than tripling of crop yields in some areas of agricultural production in Haiti, that we're actually seeing uh, more than 800,000 Haitians gain access to mobile banking services because of creative efforts that were deployed in early days and expanded upon after that, that we can work in partnership with Haitian institutions and partners on a long-term effort to offer a better trajectory for that nation and its people. And here at FIU, student branches of Engineers Without Borders and International Rescue Committee not only launched campaigns and money to raise awareness, but you also organized medical relief teams and helped Haitian immigrants fill out applications for temporary protective status. To coordinate these efforts, President Rosenberg established a task force with the current SGA Council President, Pablo Haspel, that continues today to advance long-term sustainable development in Haiti. Your work through the College of Nursing, your work through the Digital Library, your work through this place, the Wall of Wind, which I was excited to learn about, are all great examples of how you can bring your expertise to bear. Recognizing that earthquakes are not the only threat that vulnerable communities will face in the future, this 15-foot machine stimulates the power of a Category 5 hurricane so we can understand it and beat it. I think that's an amazing contribution. The test has not only helped us with emergency shelter, but it's helping to inform design of long-term sustainable homes to ensure that they're more resilient so the next time catastrophe hits, hundreds of thousands of people are not displaced or killed. So what you do is incredible and you should be proud of it. And it is a very proud legacy. You've been harnessing the power of knowledge and research, technology and innovation to literally change the world. And I would argue that now more than ever, your efforts are critical to our global success. Because we know that powerful demographic shifts are underway that will add billions of people to our population in the next few decades. We know that climate change is real and the temperatures will grow warmer, rains more erratic, droughts more vicious and continual, and that the burdens that that will place will be most acutely felt by the world's most vulnerable families. And we know that these issues will be increasingly intertwined with conflict and fragility, country after country. In fact, Yemen, a country I had the chance to visit just a few months ago, and is of course the site of significant engagement with Al-Qaeda, is likely to host the first major city in the Middle East to run out of water, Sana'a. And we can only imagine what consequences that will lead to. So we know that the challenges are considerable. But we also know that our opportunity to resolve them has literally never been greater. Private cap there used to be a time when development assistance and aid agencies like USAID and the World Bank basically defined capital flows into countries. Today we're at best in many places around the world, a tenth, a twelfth, a fourteenth of foreign direct investment, even in very, very resource poor environments. And the reason is, whereas four or five decades ago, this work was a representation of our moral values, and that continues today, now this work is critical to our economic prosperity. If we don't get there and engage our way, 
then we will simply lose the opportunity to be present in the biggest, fastest growing markets of the future. Six of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world are in Sub-Saharan Africa. When Burma shows some signs of openness, investment from all parts of the world flood in because people know that 10 years from now, that will be a vibrant growth pole in that region. So the question is, what can we achieve if we engage more effectively together? First, I believe in a generation we can end preventable child death and get nearly all children reading in their classrooms. That might sound obvious to some and uh, not quite right to others. But in the last 50 years, the world has reduced child mortality by about 70%. Now, despite this progress, this year, nearly 7 million, 6.9 million kids under the age of five will die. And the great majority, 90 plus percent, will die of very simple things because they don't get enough food to eat and they get diarrhea or pneumonia or malaria. In the last decade, we've increased school attendance by 50% around the world. But we know that not all of those kids are learning. And in fact, in some of the schools, uh, they're so crowded that actual educational attainment per student has gone down. This is why we joined UNICEF, India, Ethiopia, and more than 70 countries around the world to come together around a call to action in June of this year. We know it's now possible with new technologies, simple vaccines, bed nets, new public health strategies, e-readers like this, but also just the basic nuts and bolts of how you get kids into school and measure their educational attainment. We know it's possible to achieve the result of ending preventable child death and making sure every child everywhere gets a chance to learn basic literacy skills and have an education. And that's an achievable outcome if we commit ourselves. Second, we can accelerate poverty reduction and virtually eliminate extreme poverty. We can reduce dollar a day poverty. Actually, it's technically dollar and a quarter a day poverty. But we can reduce extraordinary poverty by nearly 90% in a generation, by 2035. This isn't fiction. Between 2005 and 2008, for the first time in our global history, every continent experienced a reduction in headcount extreme poverty. Now, you probably thought that happened decades ago, because that should be your first reaction. But the reality is, even as we saw huge growth in Asia and Latin America, and hundreds of millions of people move out of poverty, powerful forces, population growth, uh, a lack of effective poverty reduction in other parts of the world were countervailing forces to that trend. But today, we've seen moments when it all works in the right direction. And we know that we're more or less on path if we can continue the trend to achieve 50 to 60% reduction in headcount poverty. And the question is, can we just make poverty at that level of excruciating deprivation a thing of the past, and now for the first time, the experts are saying it can be done. Third, within a generation, we can help transition nearly all democracies with a bare minimum of democratic trappings to complete democracies, or at least more complete democracies, where there's a degree of transparency, anti-corruption, predictability, and engagement. And it's important to put this in context. We know that just a few decades ago, nearly 75% of all countries were not democracies. Today that's flipped, and they have that title, but don't often have that, the set of characteristics that go along with that in this region and around the world. But we know that if we stay on the trend we're on, and it takes real work and persistence, that we can in fact get there, and that new technologies will sort of force an opening if they're deployed correctly and effectively. But just setting these goals will not get us there. In order to actually get there, we have to rethink how we're doing our work and rethink our collective roles, including your role here. Today, in order to realize these goals, we need to engage everyone from big private sector companies like Citibank and Walmart 
to individual student organizations right here on campus, like FIU's Alternative Spring Break, led by Tracy Argueta. Is Tracy here? Hi, Tracy. Thank you. <laughs> Today, at USAID, we're increasingly focused on harnessing the creativity and expertise of this broad development community to solve the challenges of our time. We call this approach open source development. And it reflects our desire to literally open problem solving to everyone who could do so. Now, universities are one of my favorite places to visit because, you know, in Washington, you always got to explain why we do this work. And as, when you're with students, students seem to just get it. You grew up in a world where real-time information and good ideas aren't the, restricted to the privileged few, but actually belong to everybody who has a iPhone 5, or even a 3 or a 4, I guess. I've called this the sort of Kiva effect. I don't know how many people have heard of Kiva. Oh, good, good. But it's a website where a student can go anywhere, anyone can go online, and choose the individual dairy farmer that you might want to support in Guatemala or Kenya, and offer that farmer a $25 loan. Any entrepreneur, not just farmers, but you can get farmers. That dairy farmer can then invest in her business, vaccinate her animals, improve her feedstock, track milk output, track local prices, maybe on her mobile phone. In an open source development model, we can actually identify what are the big barriers to this person moving herself and her family out of poverty. And if we identified them and solved those problems, like creating a way to chill or pasteurize milk on farm so it doesn't uh, get wasted or spoiled, and so it could be done in a manner that doesn't require an electrical grid and a plug-in connection. That could literally change the face of poverty for a few hundred million people. And there are researchers who are on the brink of cracking that code and developing a solution to that problem. In fact, I had a chance to visit dairy farmers in Kenya who were using this kind of technology. They were actually managing their animals output disease management and feedstock uh, measurement on their mobile phone through an application that a student group somewhere had developed called iCal, <laughs> which is true. You just Google it. And, and it's great. And it just gives you a sense of what's possible in our future. If we're going to tackle our greatest challenges, then we have to employ this bigger definition of development to get us there. This uh, slide shows you a battery invented by a company of young graduates, uh, and they started a company called Egg Energy to provide off-grid electricity to homes across Tanzania. They call this their Netflix solution. Low-income families rent out portable, rechargeable, affordable batteries to power their homes for five nights at a time. In Tanzania, where 90% of people lack consistent access to electricity, but 80% do live within five kilometers of a power grid, this could be a unique solution to a pervasive problem, which if you've ever seen a picture of the world at night, you know and you see the parts of the world that simply don't have enough light. This project, the one before it, and so many other innovations that could come off of college campuses, could come out of entrepreneurs uh, working in their garages, could come out of research labs or businesses here and abroad, are all part of bringing more science, technology, and innovation to the challenge that we've laid out. And that's why we've launched a Development Innovation Ventures Fund to support entrepreneurs who have these kinds of ideas and need the resources to test it. Specifically in this region of the world, we've launched an innovations fund for the Americas dedicated to creating cost-effective solutions to development challenges in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I encourage all of you, faculty or researchers, anyone with a creative idea, to engage and apply. Because the truth is, you are part of an incredible generation of young people. On campuses across the country, you've already expressed your interest and commitment to these issues, overcrowding courses for global health and agricultural development and technology and governance and the like. In fact, since 2006, there's been a 34% increase in the number of degrees conferred in these various areas. 
At USAID, we're working hard to tap into this enthusiasm and support you on this path. And that's why I'm so pleased to announce a new fellowship opportunity to embed talent from FIU and other leading American universities directly at USAID. This fellowship will enable researchers working at the cutting edge of their field to join individual offices at USAID, be it health or science and technology, for a limited period of time. And if you're interested, we'll follow up through uh, President Rosenberg's office uh, as, and as part of this overall effort. Now this is an exciting step, but our goal is to go a little bit further. We would like to launch, and we are launching, an effort called USAID Fall Semester. And if you visit our site, you can go to usaid.gov forward slash fall semester, you'll find three buttons that say serve, solve, and join the conversation about development. And by clicking any of these three, you'll be able to access opportunities and resources tailored just for students. If you're a freshman looking for your first internship, we'll have a list of opportunities. Or you can talk to FIU student Ana Quintana, who is here today. Ana, are you here? Good. <laughs> who just finished the internship with us this past summer. Thank you. If you're working on a senior project, or a thesis or a research paper of some, time, some type, we'd like to be able to have you tap into our data, our information, our evaluation uh, information, so you can get first-hand information about what we've been doing around the world and use it to advance our own learning and your own education.